and thank you for joining us for the University of St. Francis Lecture Series, a program of the Allen County Public Library. Tonight's program is entitled Native Freshwater Mussels of Northeastern Indiana. Assistant Professor Emeritus of Biology, Warren Pryor, will discuss a study that he and his students conducted in 2008 showing changes to the mussel community from over a century ago, as well as current threats and conservation efforts for freshwater mussels. The purpose of this lecture series is, a, is to present topics of interest and research information to the residents of Allen County and to provide a platform for the University of St. Francis faculty members to share their passion for the subjects with the library's patrons. This program is being recorded by Access Fort Wayne for future viewing. And now I'd like to introduce Warren Pryor. Thank you. So, um, I didn't really know what even uh, emeritus meant uh, till I retired. And um, it, it turns out if, if, you, if you work at a place uh, for a while and you don't screw up too bad, when you leave uh, in, in academia, uh, sometimes they grant you what's called emeritus status. So um, I still have an office on campus. Um, uh, I have keys to the labs and I can play with the stuff. Sometimes I do projects with students. Um, and I don't have, I, I don't get paid. And, and I also don't have a boss anymore. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so that's, that's me. Um, <clears throat> and I've been working with, with freshwater mussels now for, uh, well, as long as my, my son's been around. He's, uh, I think he was born in 94. So, uh, I've been at this for a while, and, and this is the first um, freshwater mussel I ever collected. So that's uh, number one. <laughs> um, my, my daughter, um, Annie, and I, uh, I think she was like three years old. We went out to the river, and I just recently got my permit, and uh, we're, we're like wandering around looking for stuff, and I didn't find anything. I was kind of discouraged, and she, she reached down. She goes, look, Papa, a seashell. <laughs> so she handed me that. Um, so yeah, um, I, I've been doing this for a, a little bit. And um, uh, freshwater mussels are um, uh, native to this area. Uh, there, there's another kind that a lot of people are familiar with or, uh, called zebra mussels. And they're much smaller. They're maybe an inch long. Uh, kind of remind you of a barnacle. When they get established, they grow all over hard structures, the bottoms of boats and, you know, intake pipes and, and, and anything else they can, they can stick to so that they're, they can be a real problem. Uh, and we do have them here in Allen County. Uh, they're not a, a, a real big issue right now. Uh, the ones that I'm going to talk about mostly are the native freshwater mussels. So there's a little pile of them here. Uh, and Usually, when you when you're in biology and you're working with with some animal or plant, um, people ask you like one of the. I met a woman in church a couple weeks ago, and she asked me some question, and and I started to kind of open that Pandora's box, uh, and and you know I started talking about freshwater mussels, and she kind of just you know uh huh, uh huh, just kind of glazed over, and uh, you know mumbled and kind of wandered off. Like, why do you do this? What, what's the point? Um, so I'll give you a couple reasons. Um, freshwater mussels can make pearls. So there's an economic uh, component to this. Uh, and the crown, I think they're going to put this crown on uh, King Charles here in, in, a, in a few weeks. Uh, this is what the, the reigning monarchs wear in Britain. And it's adorned with a lot of pearls. Now, some of these are marine pearls from um, oysters. Um, some of them are from um, uh, uh, freshwater mussels too. So, you know, they, they have some value as um, uh, gems, uh, but, you know, more mundane uh, back in the day, you know, beginning of the 20th century, late 1800s, um, people in the United States made buttons out of uh, freshwater mussel shells. So there was a lot of uh, collecting that went on where they would take these, these big shells, drill them out, uh, you know, punch these sort of discs out, sand them down, drill some holes in them, and sell them as buttons. So if you go to a, like an antique store, you look in your your great grandma's button jar, you're likely to see some uh, some old freshwater mussels. So you know they they've had uh, some value as uh, you know gems for pearls. 
also um, for, for the making of buttons. Well, when plastics came along, you know, um, our, our buttons nowadays aren't made of uh, natural materials. Most of them are plastics. We don't really do that so much anymore. Although, um, cultured pearls, about 80% of that material in a cultured pearl is actually part of the shell of uh, a freshwater mussel. Uh, I think I'm going to lay this down because I, I think I might be doing myself harm. <laughs> um, so what they do is they'll take, you know, in areas where it's legal to collect freshwater mussels, like some of the southern states, Tennessee, Kentucky, so on, Mississippi, um, you can still co legally collect them. Um, they'll take that shell material, turn it into beads, ship it overseas to the, you know, Japan and, and China and so on. And then they put those beads into... Um, uh, pearl oysters, pearl oysters, and the oyster lays down two or three layers of shiny stuff on the outside. They pull those out, sell them back to us as cultured pearls. So there's still some economic um, incentive uh, to, to harvest these things. Um, <clears throat> another reason uh, that I care about mussels, and maybe you should too, is uh, they drink what we drink. So here in Fort Wayne, uh, the, uh, the tap water comes from the filtration plant and the water gets, the, the water for uh, running the filtration plant comes from a, a reservoir that's just upstream from this dam. So this is the dam at Johnny Appleseed Park. You're, you're down here on the, you know, kind of shoreline looking up at the dam. The lake above that is right adjacent to uh, PFW. And so that's, that's where we get our water. So basically, if the mussels are in good shape, the raw water for your drinking water uh, is, uh, is, is, in, is in good shape too. So um, to put this into a little bit of context as far as you know, the animal kingdom goes, when you look at how, how many species belong to each of the different major groups, um, the, the biggest group of uh, organisms, uh, animals, uh, are the arthropods. So that's the blue. You know, 75% of the species on Earth right now are arthropods. And arthropods are things like oh, um, insects, you know, butterflies, beetles, ants, um, spiders, um, crabs, um, things with, with hard exoskeletons. Those are arthropods. So they're, they're, the, they're number one. Number two in diversity are the mollusks. So the, the little um, orange slice there. So the mollusks are animals, uh, they're kind of hard to define, but you kind of have a, a basic feel for maybe what they are when I say they have a, a, almost all of them have a calcium carbonate shell, and they have kind of a squishy body, um, and a couple other features that, that unite them as mollusks. So mollusks, uh, the different classes of mollusks, uh, there's like eight that are recognized classes right now. Um, the ones that you're probably a little more familiar with are the chitons, that's in the upper left there, uh, the cephalopods, so those are the octopus, the squids, you know, the smart ones. Um, some of the octopus are mm, thought to be uh, maybe about as intelligent as a cocker spaniel, which I don't know, I've, I've had a cocker spaniel, they're, they're not all that bright, um, but you know, pretty, pretty smart for an invertebrate. Snails, uh, lower left, those are the gastropods, and finally the bivalves, those are the clams, the oysters, the mussels, and so on. So we're going to spend a little time with, um, with the bivalves. Um, and the, the bivalves, when you, you just look at that group, um, with, within the mollusks, the bivalves are the second most diverse. So the, the, the gastropods, there's more snails than any other um, um, mollusks put together, uh, but the bivalves come in second. So there's quite a few of those as well. And if you want to compare, you know, the species diversity uh, of the group uh, to, um, to others that are a little more familiar, um, Birds and bivalves run kind of neck and neck. And there's a few more birds, almost to 10,000 bird species in the world, 9,600. There's 9,200 species of bivalves worldwide. Mammals, the group to which we belong, you know, animals that have hair and the, the, the mothers give milk, there's only about 4,000 species of, of mammals. 
So, and that includes everything from like dogs, cats, um, horses, uh, humans, monkeys, whatever. Um, there's only 4,000 of us. There's more than double that, uh, the number of species of bivalves. Yeah, so I think, if I, can I make this work here? Yeah. Uh, sorry about the sound. That's, that's uh, rushing water. What you're looking at here uh, is a video of um, uh, one of our freshwater mussels, uh, and it's, it's pretending to be a fish. Yeah, that is not a fish. It's even got eye spots. It's got fins. It's got a lateral line. I mean, that's wild stuff. Some of my students took this uh, video up on Cedar Creek a few years ago. What she's doing, and she is, in fact, a female. I'm going to go back here to make sure it doesn't advance. That female is presenting a lure to, to uh, attract a fish. And she's saying please come try to take a bite out of me. Like, why in the heck would a female mussel do that? Well, she is um, uh, trying to get the fish close enough so that she can spit larva in the fish's face. Her larva, this, this is what makes the, the freshwater mussels so cool, is they have a parasitic life stage, right? Mamas and daddies, you know, they're, they are separate sexes. There's male muscles and there's female muscles. When the female muscle, you know, receives the, the, uh, the sperm from the male, she fertilizes her eggs, she develops her larva on her gills, and then waits for a fish to come so she can spit the, the larva onto the fish's face, the larva attached to its gills, and right around on the fish so that they can go to a different place, right? Muscles don't move much. Like once they, once they are where they are, they can crawl around a little bit, but as far as like going miles and miles upstream, no. The only time they can really move long distances is when they're parasitic larvae and they're attached to the fish. So, you know, hypothetically, she could deposit larvae on her, her, uh, uh, the host fish, and then the larva. And the, and the larva's there on the right. That's called a glycidium or a glycidia larva. That larva attaches to the fish and can go miles and miles and miles upstream and then wind up in a different place. All right? So it's pretty cool. And, and only the, f the freshwater mussels can do this. That's what makes them uh, unique and in the family Unionidae. So sometimes we call these Unionids. Where are the unioted mussels found? I know you're wanting to know. Well, the, the best place to go for, for diversity-wise is um, Asia. So Eastern Asia, China, Japan, Korea, those sorts of places. About 320 species right now in that part of the world. But we're a close second. North America, right now we're sitting at about 302 species of unioted mussels. Also, Central America, South America, I mean, the New World has a lot of species. Poor old, <laughs> poor old North, North Eurasia, you know, like Europe, I think there's like maybe four or six species of mussels in Britain. They're like, oh, that's adorable. You think you're all that, like compared to us. <laughs> Come on. Australia, New Zealand, not very many. You know, so we are a hot spot for freshwater and mussel diversity. It's too bad that our national animal is already taken. It's already the bald eagle. Oh, fine, fine, fine. I mean, I think, I think it ought to be quadrilla pustulosa, honestly, but, you know, nobody asked me. As I said, 302 species in North America. What about just Indiana? Historically, 74 species have been documented in the state of Indiana. And and of those 74, 46 have been documented historically in just Allen County. More than half of the, the species that have ever been found in our state have been found here, just in our little county. No? And we've had a lot of them. <laughs> this is a picture from a publication in the early 20th century. Look at that little kid standing over there, like <laughs> next to that pile. 
It says 25 tons of mussels were gathered in that one spot on the Maumee River back in the early part of the 20th century. Now, people would go out with just like garden rakes, hoes. When the water was down, like, you know, when the parts of the river was kind of dried up, they just go out there with their bare hands and just pick them up. And they were doing this for, uh, mainly for buttons. But also, you know, when they'd open them up and have a look inside, they'd feel around like, if you, if you got lucky and you found a pearl, you were set. Like that little kid could be, you know, moving into a mansion, you know. So there was a lot of economic reasons people did this. And they cleaned some of the rivers out. I mean, there was a lot of harvesting. That ended, sorry about that, that ended um, uh, in 1992, I think. Uh, commercial harvest was, a, was permitted up until that time. And mussel numbers had, had dwindled to such a point that the state of Indiana said, all right, that's it, no more. No more harvesting um, for, for uh, commercial reasons. <sighs> Mussels are in bad shape as far as, uh, you know, endangered and threatened species go. Uh, if you just look at the U.S. Uh, federally endangered species list, um, freshwater mussels right now, there's 77 of them on the list. Uh, that's equal to the number of uh, endangered birds. You hear a lot of... Um, with good reason, you hear a lot of concerns about endangered birds, uh, but uh, mussels are, are right there with them. Um, almost as many insects, a few more fishes. So uh, as a group, you know they're in they're in bad shape. And uh, one of the reasons that I, that I study them is it's just cool. Like that's that's it. That's the reason. But if you need more justification, hmm, Saint Francis of Assisi uh, asserted that uh, all animals uh, are, are our brothers and sisters. And so that that was a reason uh, to care for them and to protect them. Uh, the, the place where I work, um, one of our Franciscan values, one of our core sort of uh, guiding principles is to respect creation. And these are, you know, members of, of God's creation. So I feel like we owe it to them, you know, as relatives and as uh, fellow um, um, creatures on this earth, to respect them and to do what we can. And, and one of the, the, the things I, I read a few years ago about uh, respect for animals, plants, and, and, and otherwise, um, you know, if, if, you, if you respect your neighbor, one of the first things you do is you'll learn your neighbor's name. Like, I love this guy's name, Richard Ellsworth Call. And <laughs> Richard Ellsworth Call was a... Um, uh, a biologist back in the late 1800s um, and worked for a period of time in, in Indiana. Uh, Call wrote the first and, to my knowledge, last comprehensive um, monograph on the mollusks of Indiana. And it's called The Mollusks of Indiana. <laughs> it's a big, thick book. And he, he was also an, art, uh, an amateur artist and illustrated his own book. So I'm going to show you some pictures here in a little bit that almost all of them were hand-drawn by Call and are included in his book, uh, The Mollusks of Indiana, from 1899. So what we're going to do is we're going to respect the, the muscles enough that we're going to go through a list, and I'm just going to show you a picture and I'm going to read the common name, okay, to give you an idea of the diversity and to show them some respect. So here we go. The Mucket. I love some of these common names. The Elk Toe. Slipper Shell. Three Ridge. Flat Floater. Rock Pocket Book. Purple warty back, fan shell, butterfly, elephant ear, spike, leaf shell, purple cat's paw, white cat's paw, round, round comb shell, tubercle blossom. Snuffbox, 
ebony shell. Wabash pig toe. Long solid. Crackling pearly mussel. Pink mucket. Plain pocketbook. Wavy rayed lamp mussel. Fat mucket. Yellow sand shell. White heel splitter. Creek heel splitter. Fluted shell. Fragile paper shell. Black sand shell. Pond mussel. Washboard. Hickory nut. Three horn warty back. <laughs> Ring pink. Round hickory nut. White warty back. Orange foot pimple back. Sheep nose. Club shell. Ohio pig toe. Round pig toe. Pink heel splitter. Fat pocketbook. Kidney shell. Giant floater. Rabbit's foot. Monkey face. Warty back. Pimple back. Maple leaf. Salamander mussel. Creeper. Purple lilliput. Lilliput. Pistol grip. Fawn's foot. Deer toe. Pond horn. Paper pond shell. Raid bean. Rainbow. And that's not a muscle. <laughs> you have to have a license to work with these these days. Like I said, they don't allow, uh, the, the Indiana DNR doesn't allow anybody to um, even possess or touch a freshwater mussel shell without permission. Um, so back in 94, I applied for my first license, and I've kept that up to date. So every year I've been getting a, a new license. Um, and basically you have to be a scientist or somebody um, working with a scientist uh, in order to be granted a, a, a license. Now, I can, um, I can have helpers. So, you know, somebody could come with me and they could work under my license. Um, and as I said, I've been working in Allen County for quite a while. This is um, our, our county um, roughly uh, square, and down at the bottom is the St. Mary's River. Coming from the north is the St. Joseph River. Those come together and flow into what becomes the Maumee River and goes to Toledo. We also have a little bit of the Eel River up in the upper left-hand corner, and that sorry, the picture down there is covering a little bit of the, the Wabash down in the, in the lower left. So most of my work originally was in the, the rivers of Allen County, um, and that went from about 94 to um, uh, around 2008. Um, somewhere in the beginning, uh, I, I came, became aware of a publication by these two, <laughs> these two guys. I love the hair. Walton Clark parted in the middle. He doesn't have any hair on the right, does he? Uh, Walton and Clark uh, did a study in 1908 where they basically rented a rowboat or borrowed one, or stole it out of somebody's backyard. And they, they rode around the rivers of, of Allen County and wrote a report about what they found. And that was published uh, in, in um, uh, a journal. And their records were so good that we were able to pinpoint where they went. And uh, some of my students and I, uh, in 2008, we came back to those same spots 100 years later and we basically replicated their study. Yeah, they used a wooden boat. We used aluminum. They had oars. We had an outboard motor. Uh, but basically, we've visited the same spots, and we, we uh, compared our results to what they found. So that's uh, uh, one little piece of this. And we combined uh, that with the work of some other students, before and after, uh, that did various other projects, um, 
And I was really fortunate to work with some, some pretty awesome people, um, students at St. Francis, some folks at, um, at IPFW. This is Bob Gillespie and his student, um, Stephanie Goodman. Uh, she did a master's thesis uh, up on Cedar Creek around that same time. So we, we have able to put together some, some data in aggregate from them and from our work. And um, that's how I was able to establish that we had uh, at one time um, all these different muscles that we just saw their pi larger pictures we had um, in, in our county. Yeah? So that historically is sort of what it looks like. But thanks to, you know, their work and others, uh, some folks from Ohio State and so on, um, the, the, the historical species, you know, that Wilson and Clark and Call and those other guys uh, knew of from Allen County, uh, here in modern times, looks like we've lost um, seven of those. They've been locally extirpated. Now, that doesn't mean they're extinct. They may be found somewhere else. But here in, in our part of the country, uh, they they no longer exist. And you might look at that and go, oh, okay, well, we still have quite a few left, but I wonder what's going to happen next. You know, if we were to, to gaze into the crystal ball and you, you look at um, the, the species that are found on either a federal or a state list, you know, endangered or threatened or special concern, I put question marks over those. You know, there's a, there's a lot of species that are in, in some way or another imperiled. And you have to wonder, you know, are they going to be around in the ne another, you know, 20, 50, 100 years from now? So those are some concerns that I have. And it's not all doom and gloom. I don't like to dwell on the negative. You hear enough of that stuff. I'd like to talk about some positive things that are being done to support freshwater mussels. And one of the things my wife says was, you know, we'll hear something on the news and she's like, yeah, but what can I do about that? Like, what can I do about that? Well, you know, people are doing some things about, about these, uh, these issues. Um, the Columbus Zoo uh, and the uh, Ohio DNR and the uh, Ohio State University have collaborated on a, uh, a mussel propagation facility. Uh, it's actually across the river from the zoo. It's an old... Um, Sort of like a lodge was for I don't know, union gatherings or something like that. And the, the zoo bought it and they gutted it and they refurbished it inside. And now inside are all these big tanks and labs and stuff where for quite a number of years, uh, the staff there have been uh, uh, learning how to breed and propagate freshwater mussels, get them up to a you know relatively good size, especially species that are you know, threatened or endangered, and then put them back out in the river. And then they monitor them after they put them out. So they, they are doing captive breeding to augment and to um, help out, you know, native populations of these things in, in areas around Columbus. Uh, Tom, I got to say something about the guy in the middle. That's uh, a pretty bad picture of Tom Waters, who's sin since passed away. But Tom was uh, a, a real heavyweight in the freshwater mussel world. Uh, and <laughs> acquaintance of mine. And I heard many times, you know, different people would ask Tommy to give a talk. And like one of the questions usually was, well, can you eat them? And Tom would say, you can eat anything once. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so uh, Tom has passed on, but uh, now there's a, a new um, leader there, uh, Eva, uh, and she is um, carrying on Tom's good work. Uh, and they're actually they're they're doing another renovation and improving the facility. There's other muscle prop propagation um, uh, efforts going on. Uh, one sort of original one was at Virgi Virginia Tech. Uh, there's another um, that's occurring here in Indiana, down in Muncie. The the folks at the waste treatment plant are propagating um, mussels in in their local river down there as well. So good stuff going on in that regard. Uh, you might wonder, uh, do, do zoos and aquariums make a difference? You know, are they just a place where you go on a Sunday afternoon to, to enjoy a, uh, a fun day out with the, with the family? And that is one of their roles. But also zoos are becoming more involved in conservation. And, and this tradition goes back quite a ways. So um, can this idea of captive propagation make an impact? Well, yeah. American bison are a great example of how zoos contributed to the... Um, uh, the, the conservation of a, of a species that was darn near extinct. Like people hunted these things 
just thousands and thousands of them, you know, mowed them down on the Great Plains to the point where there were so few left that folks got really worried about it. And they took um, a number of them back to New York, uh, you know, Central Park Zoo and, and Bronx Zoo and so on. And they, they produced calves and they had calves. And, uh, you know, a lot of the bison that we have around now are the result of captive breeding due to zoo involvement. California condors are another example, a success story. Uh, Black-footed ferrets, uh, uh, Lake Victoria cichlids, uh, snails from Tahiti. I and mean, there's a lot of efforts that are going on. This, the Fort Wayne Zoo actually is breeding uh, uh, a species of salamander called a hellbender behind the scenes. They don't even have them on exhibit, but they've got you know tanks and tanks of these things, and they're they're breeding them up in collaboration with the uh, with the Indiana DNR. So, you know, zoos are another. Uh, uh, sort of success story and, and something to feel good about. Um, here in Fort Wayne, oh, that's, that's pretty ugly. Uh, we've got this project going on where they're, they're drilling a hole under Fort Wayne. Uh, and it's going to carry, when it's finished, it's going to carry a lot of water um, that would have otherwise gone into the um, um, uh, waste treatment plant and overwhelmed the system. This will be storm water that'll bypass that and go into the river. And um, uh, the, the good news is when this is done, we won't be dumping raw sewage into the Maumee River anymore when it rains a lot. That's the point. To improve water quality in the Maumee River, they're spending millions of dollars to do this. Uh, and, and so I applaud the city of Fort Wayne and the federal government to, for, for getting this uh, project to happen because you know in the long run, this is gonna really benefit uh, the animals and plants living in the mommy and, and the people that, um, that enjoy them. Another thing you can, you can feel good about is you live in a state that has uh, an, an active um, Department of Natural Resources. And in, in addition to doing things like, like hunting and fishing and, and, and game animals, uh, the state of Indiana also supports uh, non-game and endangered wildlife. And yeah, there's a little tab on there that says, Donate to the fund. <laughs> you, you can help support the conservation of things like, you know, owls and, and birds and, and fish and freshwater mussels by contributing to um, funds like this. There's a, an organization that's devoted to invertebrates called the Xerces Society. It's actually named after a, a butterfly uh, species. Um, so a lot of their focus has to do with, you know, butterflies, insects, beetles, that sort of thing, fireflies. Uh, but they also have uh, some projects going on with aquatic um, invertebrates, including freshwater mussels. You've probably heard of the, you know, Nature Society, uh, na Nature or the um, uh, Nature Conservancy and... Um, uh, the uh, World Wildlife Fund, those sort of big, flashy international organizations. We have um, uh, a local grassroots organization here called Acres Land Trust that's pretty old, actually. It, it predates some of those more famous ones. And they've been literally protecting land forever. <laughs> like, they identify um, critical habitat and go in and, and sometimes they're able to buy it up and... Uh, preserve it for uh, wildlife and, and, and plants. Uh, the uh, uh, Acres Land Trust um, purchased some land out near where I live now uh, along uh, the shores of Crooked Lake uh, a few years ago, and they uh, went too far. They um, uh, uh, eventually turned it over to the state of Indiana, so now it's, it's being protected as wildlife habitat uh, in perpetuity. Speaking of Crooked Lake, uh, in about uh, 2008, I said we did that project uh, on the Maumee River. Um, and not too long after that, uh, Bob Gillespie from what was then IPFW introduced me to a field station that they had out on the shores of Crooked Lake uh, out west of Fort Wayne. Now, there's two Crooked Lakes in Indiana. Uh, one is up by Angola. The good one, <laughs> where, where I like to work, uh, is, is out uh, west of Fort Wayne about seven miles north of Columbia City. And yeah, it's kind of crooked. So there's its outline there. In the, the lower sort of south uh, eastern corner there is a little sort of sandbar area. 
uh, where we've been working uh, since well, really 2009. And when I say we, I mean my students, my family, pretty much anybody I can finagle in there uh, to help me. Uh, we've been working out there on the muscle bed since then. So this little inset here shows um, the, the area that we work. It's, it's about the size of maybe a you know, football field, maybe a little bigger. Um, so not very large. But it's, it's a nice sort of sandy, gravelly area adjacent to the State Nature Preserve. What we do is um, in the mm, sort of right at the beginning of the summer, so into June and then usually in, uh, toward the end of September, early October, uh, we'll go out there for a Saturday and we'll, we'll wade from one end to the other. Everybody's got these little red flags with them. And every time we see a mussel, we stick that in the, in the sand and we just keep it going until we get them all marked. Then we come back, usually have a cup of coffee or something, and then we go back in teams of three or four, and we go to those flags, and one at a time, pull them out, take the muscle out, measure it, weigh it, uh, identify it, take a picture of it and all that, do, do, the, do the, the boring science stuff, the, the data gathering. Um, and by the end of the day, all of those red flags have been replaced with blue ones, indicating that they're, we found them all, we pick our blue flags up, we go home. This is what we see. Um, this is a, a, a fat mucket uh, in its natural habitat. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, a couple little black spots on there. One of those is where the water goes in. That's the in-current siphon. And then another, the other um, hole is where the water comes out, a little bit cleaner than it went in. So they filter the water as they're sitting there. And that's basically their life. That's what they do. They filter water. And it's like this. They just kind of like. <laughs> Once in a while, they'll go. <laughs> and then. That's it. Well, okay, they make babies. Spit their larva on the fish. Yeah, very. Very calm animals. They don't, they don't do a lot of thinking. They don't, you know, worry about a lot of stuff. They just filter water. Yeah. So we gather them up. Um, and as I say, you know, we put the calipers on them. We write all this information down, record it. Oh, and we tag them. Yeah. And, and in, you know, having done this for a few years, this is a little bit of data. I'm not going to belabor, belabor this too much. You, you've been very patient so far, so I don't want to try your patience. Um, we found out a few things. One of the things we've, we've learned is in that little area of that one lake, there's five species. Now, that's not very many compared to Allen County, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a nice little number to work with. Most of the... Um, uh, the, the species, or most of the individuals belong to one species. That's Lampsilus siliquidia. Sorry about the Latin name. Those are the fat muckets. The second most common are the giant floaters. Pyganodon, Pyganodon grandis. Legumia subrestrata, the pond mussel. Sorry. Third. And then a couple that are pretty rare. The spike, Elliptio dilatata, and the wavy rayed lamp mussel, Lampsilus fasciola. Those last two, by the way, are now um, of special concern to the state of Indiana. So, you know, the, the, um, the, the conservation concerns are even, you know, even making their way into uh, the wilds of Crooked Lake. As I said, we tag them, and we do this with um, sh uh, uh, shellfish tags. Like, <laughs> you know, there's a niche for everything. There's this company in uh, in California that makes these tags and they make them they make them tiny they make them big they put them on on tuna they put them on you know, uh, marlin I mean, game fish people love these things you know they put them on oysters they, you, you, there's all different kinds different colors different ways of numbering them blah 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 and there's exactly one woman you need to talk to like if you want these tags you better make her happy and don't you dare like you know not pay your invoice or you're never going to get your shellfish tags ever again we have a bunch of these we stick them on there with super glue 
And they stay on really well, like year after year after year. We put one on one shell, one on the other, two, two on each muscle. So if one falls off, we still know who that is. We can put a new tag on so we don't lose track. What is the ship doing there? I don't know. Okay, another thing we've learned about muscles, and you know, besides who's who and what's what, is how fast they grow. That was one of our basic questions when we started this study back you know, years ago. How fast do they grow? Finally getting to the point where we've got enough data from tagged muscles that I can answer the question. And you are the first people outside of my poor wife and kids that have get to hear this, right? 0 0.935 millimeters per year. Woo! That's less than a millimeter. That's like, can you see that from the camera? Like, it's not very much, right? doesn't seem like much, but a, a little bit increase in growth when you're already kind of big can mean a lot of volume or weight increase. And to illustrate that, I chose a ship, two ships, I went back in, the, in some of my uh, books, and I found two ships from the early um, United States Navy. One of them was the USS Hancock, and she was 136 feet long. And there was another one just a little bit bigger, the Essex, USS Essex. That's five feet difference in length, one ship to the other. And it's like five feet? Like, you know, it's not very big. Not much, but when you when you look at how much bigger the Essex was than the Hancock, that five feet of difference in length, you figure you know to make the the ship five feet longer, you also have to make it a little bit wider. You have to make it a little bit taller. That increases the whole size of the ship. So a little bit of an increase in length translates into a lot of increase in volume or weight. You do the same kind of thing with, with muscles. If you take a muscle, starts off, and this is kind of just for illustration purposes, starts off, maybe it's 10 years old, and it's already 95.4 millimeters long. And you add, over the course of a year, 0.9 millimeters, just rounded it off, that, that's a little bit of an increase in length. But that winds up being something like 3 grams per year in volume for that one individual. Okay. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 muscles of that species in our muscle bed. You take 500 times 3 grams, that's 1,500 grams per year. Okay. You guys are Americans. I'm an American. We don't think in metric. I don't anyway. I always think in pounds and, and you know, inches and feet. That's a little over three pounds per year that would be an increase in size of the muscles in that whole population of 500. So what that's saying is that these animals that live down in the sediment are taking 3.3, or what's that, three pounds, five ounces of material out of the plankton from going like this, day after day, year after year, right? All of them together are removing that material from the plankton and putting it into what we call the benthos. That's the stuff on the bottom of the lake, okay? So if those muscles weren't around, there'd be, you know, if all things are equal, there would be more plankton in the water, right? Yeah. I think that's cool. We're continuing to do this. This is an ongoing project. Yeah, I'm retired, but I'm not dead. And I like to fool around with this stuff. I like to get people out there in, in nature collecting data. And we plan on doing this again in June. We plan on doing it in September. And it's, it's a lot of fun. If you have an interest in that kind of stuff, or if you want to learn more about muscles, you're welcome to email me. You could scan this QR code if you like. That QR code will take you to my YouTube channel where from time to time, as I feel like it, and we have things to talk about, I'll give updates on freshwater mussel um, research in our area. And that is all I have to say formally, but I will entertain questions. We have some time if you have anything you'd like to ask. 
Yes, the question was, zebra mussels uh, are, are a concern in the Great Lakes, but why not here? Yeah. Um, and I, honestly, I don't know why, other than pixie dust and knocking on wood, that they haven't really been that much of a problem, at least to my knowledge, at, to this point in you know, in county in this part of the country. Um, we found, I want to say it was maybe 2009 or 2010, I can't remember, but my students and I were working out at Johnny Appleseed Park doing a kind of a routine survey, and we found live zebra mussels then. Uh, and we have seen evidence just in the little, the few times that we've returned, we have seen evidence of zebra mussels since. But I haven't seen the, the massive incrustations that my colleagues do in like Lake Erie and Lake Michigan and Huron. I mean, I've seen them. I've seen them in the Mississippi River where there's just, there's so many zebra mussels. You can't see the, like, there's no sand. It's just, you're just walking on shells. I don't know why we don't have that here. I'm not complaining. <laughs> right. Okay. So the question was, um, in case you didn't hear, um, why is it that the the number of species of um, unionated mussels, freshwater mussels, um, is so high in North America and in East Asia, but not in other places? So we'll take Australia, for example, uh, that only has a few species compared to, let's say, China or North America. Uh, <sighs> The conventional wisdom, and I have, I have no reason to doubt it, is that um, the, um, the, the freshwater mussels as a group evolved in uh, Asia, and early in their evolution, um, some of them came to North America, either across like the, uh, uh, the Bering Land Bridge, somehow or another got to uh, Amer the Americas. And so their sort of evolutionary history is, is centered in those two land masses. But Australia <laughs> didn't get them till much later on, was, was off kind of on its own and didn't have freshwater mussels at all for a long time. So that's kind of roundabout explanation that I, I think it has an evolutionary explanation. Uh, I don't know that it's habitat. Kind of like um, uh, woodpeckers. You know, we have woodpeckers here. There are no woodpeckers in Australia because they've just never made it there. Uh, but if you look at it the other way, there's a whole lot of marsupials in Australia and South America, and we've got exactly one here, which is the the, the opossum. So kind of an evolutionary explanation yeah she the question was what's the greatest threat to native freshwater mussels I, yeah i think it's um it, it's a multi-pronged thing um pollution is a big deal um so that that's that's an issue uh habitat destruction is another so dredging rivers um channelizing rivers uh, dams are, are a real issue. They call that impoundment. And dams have two, mm, at, le at least two problems associated with them from the perspective of mussels. One is dams uh, create, you know, you, you have a river and the water is flowing and there's certain like oxygen and chemistry characteristics of the water and so on. Um, and then you put a, a wall there, you create a dam, and now everything above the dam is now more like a lake. And most mussels would rather live in rivers than lakes. As you saw, there's, there's five in this lake, and there's you know, 30, 40 some in the rivers. So most mussels have evolved to living in a, in a river situation. So when you put them, you, know, you plunk them into a lake, a lot of them just can't cope and you know, that's no good. Also, um, dams, uh, many dams prevent the movement of fish. So, you know, there's some dams that they build like f fish ladders so fish can get around them. They go up these like sh sh stair step things. Um, the dams that we have in, in Allen County, like the one I showed you at Johnny Appleseed Park, 
a fish really can't get up above the dam. So that prevents the movement of the hosts and that impacts their reproduction. So those are a couple issues. Uh, and obviously things like poaching, you know, um, there, there still are, there, uh, there are people, you know, if money's to be made uh, illegally, there's people that are going to do it. And there are people that will poach uh, freshwater mussels for, for the shell material. And that's obviously illegal. People go to jail for that. Like if you, if you, if you do that with a federal species, you're probably going to go to federal prison. And they're, they're serious about enforcement. So, you know, there's always, there's always that. Yeah. Yes. So the question was uh, the, the youngins, the, the larvae, the larva, when they fall off, uh, where do they go? Yeah. Well, yeah, okay, so they're microscopic to begin with. Uh, even when they fall off the fish, you can't, you, you have to have really good eyes to see them. They're like a speck. So microscopic. Um, and they probably, I would say, don't have agency in de determining when and where they fall off the fish. I think it's more of a matter, okay, I've been on the fish a while. I'm just going to fall off today <laughs> and whatever happens, happens. I think that's m probably the case. Um, once they're off the fish and they're, they go into the sediment, um, it's, it's still, after studying these things for 150 years, people still don't really know for sure where they go and what they eat. It's thought now that the, the juvenile mussels burrow down in the sand, disappear, and just stay there for the first maybe two or three years of life. And then when we see them, they're maybe, you know, three quarters of an inch long. Like it, when we work with them at Crooked Lake, the, the, the really small ones, I mean, they're like an inch. They're, they're, so there's something going on between when they're sort of born or fall off the fish and when we pick them up as, you know, large juveniles or, or sub-adults. And it's thought that they're probably... Um, and, and there's not a whole lot of evidence either way, but it's thought that they're probably down in the sediment feeding on bacteria, fungi, and stuff. Rather than filtering it with their gills, they're probably eating it, uh, they call it pedal feeding. They're using their foot. They have this like tongue-like structure that comes out, and they have cilia on there that can gather up material and bring it back to their mouth. So that may be what's going on, but... Yeah, we if you if you knew that answer, you could probably get your PhD like right now. Yeah, because people would like to know that. Yeah. When when we did it, when we did okay, yeah. So so the question was, you know, could we could we do these? Our our methods uh, in the lake are visual, but when we're working in in turbid uh, river conditions, how did how did we do that? Uh, we. We did it by letting the muskrats do our work for us. So muskrats are mammals uh, that are semi-aquatic, uh, and uh, normally they eat uh, vegetation like cattails and stuff. But when muskrats need some protein, they'll go after anything, and mussels are an easy target. So muskrats will go down and feel around in the bottom of the river, and I think get their mouth around it, they'll bring those back up on shore and wait for the muscle to open and, you know, eat the guts and there you go. So what we would find would be these, these shells that had recently been, the meat had been consumed by muskrats and we would just collect the shells and examine those. Um, and, and muskrats will, when they find a, a source They'll, they'll exploit that. So we might find 30 or 40 in a muskrat midden, like a little pile of shells. That There's, a, there's an afternoon's work right there. Yeah, picture on, on the boat with a bucket, yeah. dragging a bucket along the bottom of it. Yeah, uh, that, that's another kind of inefficient way to do it, but we would, that was up on, I think, Cedar Creek uh, when we took that picture. Uh, so s some, sometimes the water can be shallow enough and clear enough that you can you can go out with a glass bottom bucket and look. Uh, other folks, um, you know, and we've never done this because there's a whole another level of training and certification, uh, we'll use divers, like scuba divers, uh, weighted with 
30, 40 pounds extra so that they're basically crawling on the bottom of the river in scuba gear, you know, with their face like that close to the substrate in order to find these things. So expensive, time consuming, can be dangerous. Uh, none of the kind of things I wanted to ever do with my students. So, yeah. yeah good question. Others? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the explanation for why these, like, the total numbers go up and down um, probably didn't really have much to do with, with industry so much as um, how, how good we were that particular muscle roundup, how, how many people were out with us, how thorough they were at looking. Uh, and also, um, th this is not a, a bare bottom that we're working in. There's a lot of vegetation and stuff. Uh, even leaves and stuff can get in the way. So, you know, when you're out there looking around, if there's a, a mat of, you know, plants, you're probably not going to see mussels there. So there's a lot of kind of randomness to um, the, the total catch that we might get on a, during a particular roundup. Or the temperature can have an effect. So if you look at, like, uh, that, that third column from the left, W2017, there, we only have found 15 but that was two days before Christmas. There was windowpane ice on the lake. There were three students with me, and I thought this is a stupid idea to begin with. What are we doing out here? <laughs> you know, in, in ice cold water. But also the um, there, and there's other data from other studies to to support this that mussels um, will will go up and down, like they will surface like in nice warm conditions and when it gets uncomfortable for them, too cold or whatever, they'll burrow down maybe three or four inches and you're not gonna see them. So I think it's probably more due to that kind of, you know, stuff. Yeah. I, I saw a hand over here. That. They are ecosystem engineers. They are keystone species that we don't, we don't recognize how important they are until they're gone. But in places where they are extirpated, where they are gone, um, freshwater mussels are, um, constitute a large percentage of the benthic biomass, the stuff living down on the bottom. A lot of that flesh is filter feeding freshwater mussels. And when you mess with that, that's what happens. There's, a, there's another um, bivalve that lives in the Mediterranean called the pen shell. And the pen shells used to be very, very numerous. Um, and they're quite large. They're foot long. And they filter feed like this. Well, they've been, they've been exploited for food. They've been... Um, uh, impacted by pollution, so forth. And so the Mediterranean has seen a drastic decline in pen shell abundance. And they're seeing that the, the aftermath of that, uh, the effects on water quality and other organisms living in that ecosystem, because not as many pen shells, not as much filtration taking place. So the, the, the question was when this... Um, um, uh, tunnel under Fort Wayne is completed and we're not dumping raw sewage into the Maumee however many times a year. I think it's like a dozen, 20 different times. However many different large rain events you get. Um, I think you'll see in, in, in a you know, fairly quick turnaround time a, a drastic improvement in water quality. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an environmental scientist. I don't know all that stuff. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a muscle guy, but I, I really, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the impact of that because I think it is going to help. And we have cleaned things up. I mean, since that survey in 2008, um, it, it, even since then, the water quality has gotten better. Uh, but I think it's going to, that, that's really going to make an, an impact. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate everybody's attention and you all coming out tonight to see this on a, on a beautiful evening. Thank you. Production facilities provided by Access Fort Wayne. Learn more under the Explore tab at acpl.info.